Hello everyone, this is Michael Soilo and I am doing a review of Joshua Mason's uh, Steam Whistle Alley and Adventure in Augmented Reality. Uh, the teal deer version of this book is that it is a four stars out of five book. It has, it's definitely a your mileage may vary sort of novel because there's some things it does really well and there's some things that it also does really bad. And depending upon like how you weigh the pros versus the cons, what sort of uh, opinion you're going to have of the book overall. But for me, it was about a four star out of five. Uh, enjoyable, but there were some problems that tended to rapidly accumulate towards the end of it. Uh, so first, reviewing the um, the reviews take place in three parts. First, I review the audiobook. Second, I give the spoiler-free version of the book, and then I go into my particular criticisms at the third part of the book. Um, the narrator was Sienna. I think that is the pronunciation of her name, Briar. This is the first and only book that I've seen she's done, um, but she did a great job. She uses several distinct and different voices throughout. There's no audio pops or clicks. I don't hear any background humming noise. Uh, the volume leveling stayed consistent, and the use of audio effects to simulate his internal thinking uh, was done very well. She has what I would call an androgynous voice. She can switch between male and female very easily. Um, so that's uh, an asset for any sort of narrator uh, to be able to do that. So all in all, her narration was really good. Now, for the book itself, the spoiler-free version of it is that... Um, a guy is watching out of a window at a coffee shop and he sees someone um, doing the sword motions of someone who is uh, fighting a character in a video game and he follows the person around and records them. Then he finds out that person is actually the creator of a new augmented reality game. Uh, I don't remember if it's called Steam Whistle Alley or if that's just the name of a particular section of it, but that is, he finds out that's the creator of that game and um, the, he offers him like his own goggles in order to jump into the game and the book itself is not very action packed. Um, it is way more story and character driven than it is action driven. And that's why for two groups of people, they're really going to enjoy this book. The first is some people complain on forums and on different message boards that lit RPG has too many Lord of the Rings, sort of like big climactic battles. It's all, uh, Avengers Infinity Wars, and they say, well, where's my Spider-Man Homecoming? Uh, this is your Spider-Man Homecoming. This is a much smaller scale story uh, with much smaller stakes and much more personal stakes rather than, you know, uh, the fate of the entire world rests on this game um, sort of a deal. And the second one, this book veers into PG-13 territory, but I know there's a lot of people who say I would like to introduce my nephew or niece into Gamelit, but... You know, several of the biggest name books, uh, Delvers and The Land and several other ones, like you cannot give that to someone who's under the age of 18 and feel good about yourself. Uh, this is a book you could give to someone who's 13 or older, because again, there's some mature elements, but uh, they're, they're not gratuitous um, and they are not explicit. So if you're one of those two camps looking for a smaller scale story or looking for something you can recommend to your relatives, this is that book or uh, Robert Bevan's Caverns and Creatures, another one you really can't recommend uh, to the youngsters. So this is that book. Uh, now, the other thing that's really nice about this book um, is that it's also one of the few stories that doesn't have like, I am the one person in the world who figured out this very obvious exploit or cheat or backdoor that allows me to power level above everyone else and become, you know, the the grandmaster of the video game, despite of only just starting to play it and beating players years in advance. None of that. This is just straight up gameplay. Uh, the best elements of it are definitely the descriptive elements of the world and the universe and everything else going on there. Uh, where it breaks down is there is a lot of uh, hand waving particularly when it comes to the villains and how they're able to do so much. Uh, the villains in this game are able to hijack software and hijack biosynth and hijack even people. And uh, all that through a pair of virtual goggles is, is kind of incredible. And this brings up one of my popular criticisms of game lit and lit RPG in general is that um, I call it the two world problem. And that is that if you have people committing all these crimes. Like there has to be a justification for how that can happen. 
Uh, you cannot just simply pretend like uh, numerous violations of computer laws, um, each of which has a 20 year maximum prison sentence per instance of tampering, uh, somehow we could get away with that. And so there's a lot of suspension of disbelief and there's some mechanics that just don't make sense towards the end. Um, so it definitely breaks down towards the end, but it's mostly an enjoyable ride till you get there. So here is my spoiler filled version of it. Uh, this way I go into the long critique of it. Uh, the first big problem is uh, there's a violation of Chekhov's gun. And if you don't know what that means, Chekhov's gun basically says if you introduce a gun in the first act, you need to use it by the third act. So don't introduce a story element and then not do anything with it. Um, everything should go somewhere. In this case, uh, I've written an article called The Use and Abuse of Tropes. And one of the things that I say in that article is that uh, the important thing about tropes isn't that you not use them, it's to understand what they're there for and then to decide if maybe that is the best way to go about it or if there's maybe another way to go about it that would achieve the same effect. In this one, the violation occurs with the little sister side story. Um, this is a very popular trope in game lit and lit RPG and that is that the protagonist has an injured or sick or otherwise disabled little sister and so they're playing the video game in order to earn money for their little sister. And there's a lot of reasons why this is not a good trope. And the reason for this trope to exist, right, is because uh, we don't want the protagonist who's just playing the game to have fun. So they want, the author wants a uh, higher elevated reason for this game to exist and for the main character to be doing it. So, oh, I'm really trying to help out my little sister. The problem is in most of these games, the, the protagonist ends up being phenomenally wealthy before the books even concluded and so then it's like well if his whole motivation was his little sister then when he's got the money he should get out of the game right like it's not a very strong explanatory factor for why he's playing the game um, and really it, it doesn't really go anywhere with that side plot it's just meant to be a character development trope and to sort of explain some of the hang-ups the protagonist has now as i already mentioned um the bad guys break numerous laws um, at both the state and federal level, uh, which includes the state level unauthorized use of a computer, computer trespassing, and computer tampering in the first, second, third, and fourth degree. The last one, computer tampering in the first degree, is a 15-year prison sentence per instance of violation. At the federal level, you get into U.S. Code Section 1030, fraud and false statements, fraud and activity related in connection with computers. That is a 20 year sentence uh, and quarter million dollar fine per instance uh, of the violation. So in this game, the bad guys uh, are basically worked at the same company as the creator and they inserted malicious code that allows them to hijack the AR sets and to hijack uh, biosynths, all of which would uh, immediately get the NSA, the FBI and several other alphabet soup agencies on your ass for uh, some serious uh, criminal violations, and it would also get the main company shut down if they knowingly release software which could harm end users. Uh, that is a crime. So there's a lot of hand waving and sort of ignoring that fact. Uh, and the bad guys also have like police and other federal agents on the payroll, and it's like, really, how how would that work exactly if you're you're a game programmer, but you also have like black market connections. Uh, so the bad guys are definitely one of the biggest issues in the book. Um, so what I would have done to sort of get around that problem is the way that hackers um, typically work is if you get caught for hacking and you're any good, you often get recruited by the FBI, NSA, or one of the other federal agencies. If you remember um, the kid who invented Reddit, Aaron Schwartz, I think is his name, uh, he was offered a deal where um, he could use a computer, but he would have to go to prison for six months and he would have to work for the NSA. Um, and instead of taking it, he took his own life. Um, the other option for him was to basically be sentenced to 30 years in jail. Um, and he didn't like that one either. So I would have made it so these bad guys had been captured and they were FBI or NSA assets and were uh, having some sort of dispute with China, Russia, North Korea, one of the, any Iran, we're hacking Iran currently, so that would be a great topical event. Um, one of those sort of countries, so that way uh, the police have a hard time prosecuting them because they're uh, doing work in exchange for federal help. Uh, 
even that would still be kind of flimsy because one of the terms and conditions of your agreement with the government is that you will not commit any further crimes um, outside of ones you are authorized to commit. So it would void their, their agreement with the government if they did that. But that would at least give them some a uh, little bit of a loophole. The other, uh, another plot trope that gets brought up here is sort of like Ready Player One, where whoever wins the contest ends up becoming the auctioneer for the game, and they can sort of decide how Steam Whistle Alley evolves, and uh, they get paid a certain percentage of all the transactions, which is worth millions and millions of, they call them net coins in the book, I believe, but millions of dollars, let's say. Uh, this is another problematic trope because the reason for it to exist is the main guy is dying as opposed to Ready Player One where the main guy was already dead. But um, in this book, it's meant to be, uh, well, there's a twist actually on that in the book. But anyway, uh, it's meant to be like uh, the motivation for doing things, but it doesn't really make sense, right, for this one person who wins the video game to be able to decide the future of the game because what if they're like really terrible about it what if they like disappear for months on end uh what's sort of the recourse there it seems more like this would be sort of an electoral position rather than like decided by one playthrough of the game particularly when the main guy who created this game knows there are people actively cheating and trying to break the rules so what would happen if someone who broke the rules won would they still honor the end contract um, that is very disputable. So those are sort of the criticisms of the book. Um, what it gets right is the, the extreme detail to the environment, uh, the character building and the world building. The game mechanics are purposefully very light um, because the inventors of this VR goggle or AR goggle headset don't want to um, be overly intrusive and they want it to be as real world as possible but some of the mechanics for how that would work are very hand wavy. Um, so you sort of have to get over that. But if you're looking for the story and character driven novel, then this would be your pick. So again, final review, four stars out of five.